promises in the Bible. And that's a promise that we can stand on. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. We're going to be looking at several different passages today, and I've got a head start on you. Mine are marked with paper clips, so I can get there quick. You may just want to jot, I'll try to tell you the passage I'm at, you may just want to jot that down on the outline in case uh, you want to go back and look at it later. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, where Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. In 1994, there was a 67-year-old carpenter named Russell Herman who died in Marion, Illinois. In his last will and testament, he left the following. $2.4 billion to a nearby town. $2.4 billion to the city of East St. Louis. $1.5 billion for projects in southeastern Illinois. And then, in a final act of unprecedented generosity, he left $6 trillion to the Federal Reserve to pay down the national debt. There was only one problem. At the time of his death, the only thing Mr. Herman actually owned was a 1983 Oldsmobile Toronado. Now, Russell Herman may not have left behind anything of monetary value, but he leaves us with a very good reminder. You can't give away what you do not possess. And the bottom line is, is that he did not have the resources to make any of this a reality. But that's not so with God. As I shared just a few moments ago, you know, we live in a world of broken promises, the outlandish political promises I alluded to, the -the over-the-top ads for fast food. Do you notice when you look at the pictures of the fast food that's up on the screen and then you order it, and when you get your order, it does not look like what that picture looks like? I'm oftentimes tempted to give it back, says, no, I want this, not what this is. That don't even look like the same thing. Many of us have become very skeptical whenever we hear someone make a claim that appears to be too good to be true. But here is the big idea I want us to get across today. The big idea I think we want to learn from these few moments together is this. In a world of broken promises, God can be counted on. In a world of broken promises, God can be counted on. And according to one estimate, and I hadn't sat down to count these, but I've seen this in two or three places, people have said there are over 30,000 promises found in the Bible. And I think one thing we learn as we look at these promises, God never over-promises and He never under-delivers of those promises He gives us. Now I want to take a few moments to just sort of set the stage, some pointers about promises we need to remember. You're looking at that outline and said, man, there's eight things here. It's going to take us forever to get through that. No, it, it won't. I want to hit these very quickly to give us something to think about to establish some of the characteristics of God's promises. The first is this. Put the promises in their context to get their full meaning. You know, one of the most popular promises we hear people quote is this, I will never leave you nor forsake you, right? But sometimes we seldom quote the first part of the verse, which says, which is Hebrews 13, 5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
Because of the promise of God's presence, we can live free from the love of money and become more content with what we have. Put the promises of God in the context in which they're found in Scripture. Second thing, be willing to accept all of God's promises, not just the ones that you like. For example, God promises persecution and suffering and difficulty for the Christ follower. In John eleven thirty three, he says, you will have tribulations. In this world, you're going to have tribulations. And we can't just put the pleasant promises up on our walls and act surprised when the tribulations and the suffering come into our lives. Now, having said that, we hold on to the next part of this verse because we know that we don't suffer alone because Jesus says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Third thing, the ultimate aim of God's promise is to glorify Himself. Be very careful about demanding that God must do something for you. We can't just name it and claim it without worshiping the name that is above all names. Because, you see, he wants to display his honor and his glory. Psalms 119.38 says, Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Honor who God is. Don't demand from him. He's God and we're not. Fourth, some promises are conditional. God will do His part when we do ours. I'm going to turn quickly to several passages. The first is Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 22 and 23. You may not be able to get there fast enough because I'm going to zip on through. For if you will be careful to do all this commandment that I command you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in all His ways, and holding fast to Him, Then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you, and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. You see that? If you will do this, then I will do this. There's another one. We know this one. We quote it all the time when we get ready to pray for our country. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And notice... If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. We mistakenly pray we can, we can read this verse and we can claim this verse and God's going to change everything. But that's one of these, if my people, who's my people? That's you and I. That's those who are Christ followers. If this is what we will do, then God will do this. If we want to see our country change, we may need to be thinking about what's it going to take for God's people to get back to being what God wants them to be. Instead of blaming the politicians and all these other wackos out there. Oh, this is being videoed it now. Be careful. (laughs) If, then. There's one more. James chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and then He will exalt you. So we need to remember some promises are conditional, God says, I'm going to do this, but first, you've got to do this in order for that to happen. Fifthly, promises must be appropriated and applied by faith. Charles Spurgeon said this, Do not treat God's promises if they were curiosities for a museum 
but believe them and use them. When we exercise our faith, God promises become very personal to us. The writer of Hebrews wrote, For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Those things did not come about because they were not people of the faith. It didn't apply to them. They were not part of receiving God's promises. We're told that Jesus did not do many miracles in his hometown of Nazareth because of their unbelief. This is also very clearly seen with the giving of the promised land. Joshua 21, 43 says, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers. The promise of the land was given to them, but they had to take hold of the promise to make it their own. And the latter part of that verse says, And they took possession of it, and that is where they settled. Let us not be like the people that are described over in Psalms 106.24. When the psalmist wrote, they despise the pleasant land having no faith in his promise. We must, we must appropriate and apply by faith the promises God's given us. And the next, don't be passive about God's promises. The early evangelist Charles Finney put it like this, the promises were made to be used by God's children by all who will believe them and appropriate them. Psalms 13.4, sorry, Proverbs 13.4. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly applied. Next, make sure you're spiritually prepared to receive God's promises. God is looking for surrendered hearts and for those who are quick to confess sin. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 66, If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. And then remember this, characteristics of God's promise, and something that we must do is hold on to hope. You know that sometimes we have to wait a while before that promise is fulfilled. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Sometimes as we're waiting on God's promises that we're asking for and seeking and looking for and we know of, we're looking for those things to happen and happen quickly, but we need to understand we need to have hope to hold on to those that we don't give up we don't bail out when we think God has failed us. And I've seen that happen again and again. People just bail out on God say, you know, so what? He, he's not going to help. He promised, but he's not coming through. Remember this. A promise is the assurance that God gives to his, his people so that they can walk by faith while they wait for him to work. A promise is the assurance that God gives to His people so they can walk by faith while they wait for Him to work. I want you to know, in a world of broken promises, God can be counted on. Now, I want to look at two very powerful passages. I printed those verses or those scripture references in the outline. Two powerful promise passages. And the first one is found in 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. 
It should be very comforting to us that God has already given us everything we need to live in our life and for us to also grow in godliness. Two things we're called to do from this passage. We're called to unleash God's power in our lives. You know, I've just been in a, in, in, in a week, almost week-long meetings with other church leaders from across the, the country, about 600 of us there. And we went to a lot of workshops and breakout sessions to learn some things about helping churches revitalize, be rejuvenated. Heard a lot of good preaching and teaching. But do you know that we don't need another book, we don't need another blessing, we don't need another seminar or another experience if we know Jesus? Now, we go to these things, they're, they're helpful. Matter of fact, I sat in through some of those things and listened and said, yeah, I know that, but I'm just not doing it. So, so many times people are just running from here to there. I got to get this. I got to get that. I got to get this. I got to get this. But if you know Jesus, notice what he says in verse 3. Has granted to us all things. All things. You have all that you need right now to be all that God wants you to be. Because the words, two little words, all things, means everything. I know how some of your minds work. So you're thinking, I don't have to come back to church again. I got everything I need. No, you don't. You also, out of the fellowship and coming together, you encourage and you build up. And that's even part of the all things. God says, I'm giving you all these things, and part of it is your opportunity to worship and to study my word and to commune and pray and talk with me. Second thing we learn, and we find it in verse 4, is we need to utilize God's promises. His promises are to be prized because they are precious. More precious than silver more precious than gold. John Bunyan wrote uh, Pilgrim's Progress, spent much of his life in prison for his faith, and he, he wrote these words, The pathway of life is strewn so quickly with the promises of God that it is impossible to take one step without touching upon one of them. If you would be observant of your day, as you go through your day, as you just live out your moments of life, I am am almost assured you will encounter one promise after another from God because there are so many and they're so available to us. In a world of broken promises, God can be counted on. And in that first verse that we we read as we began this morning in 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. We learn that the promises of God are not yes and then no. The promises of God are yes. The promises of God are not I don't know or maybe so. The promises of God are yes. The promises of God say again and again, yes, this is what I will do. This is who I am. And aren't you glad that our salvation has nothing to do with our promises to God, but rather what He promises to us? And we ask you an important question this evening, this morning, before we go. Have you received the promise of eternal life. 1 John 2.25 says, and this is the promise He made to us, eternal life. 
Now, until you have believed and you have received, God's promises will not be accessible to you. And you need to know that there's an extreme urgency in being saved and giving your life to Christ. One day it's going to be too late. And you know what? That's a promise from God as well too. One day it will be too late. But because God is patient, He's giving you time right now to decide to follow His Son, Jesus. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. We learned a lot of things about God's promises this morning. But probably one of the the most important promise for you to take into your life today, if you're not a Christ follower, is that if you're ready to receive the promise of forgiveness and eternal life and just own up to God, you know what, God? I'm lost without you. I'm a sinner. I confess that. I turn from my life that I'm living to place my, my trust in you, not my trust in myself or others. And if you come believing that Jesus is a promised one, that when he died on the cross, he did so as your substitute. And if you come trusting that he paid the price for all of your sins, then you can claim the promise of eternal life. And that's the most important promise that's offered to you today if you do not follow Christ and trust in Him. We invite you to do that because I said moments ago, none of this applies to you until you surrender and you receive Him into your life. And you know what? You can do that right now. Even right where you sit. Or when we stand and then we sing in just a moment, we're going to be seeing living for Jesus, a life that is true. And we we invite you to live for Jesus today. If you are a Christ follower living for Jesus And these promises can be very affirming or they can also be very mm, pointing out there's some things I need to adjust in my life. And we would encourage you to do that today. Recommit, rededicate, renew that wonderful fellowship if God says, then I will do this. Maybe today you're looking for a church home and you'd like to be a part of this church family. We'd love to share with you what that means. We're going to stand together in just a moment and sing. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Then we'll invite you to come down and just share with me as God leads you to do that today. I was kind of fearful getting in front of us folks, but uh, I'm going to tell you something. Um, If you don't know those people here, they're going to love you. They're going to care about you. And this is one of the safest places I know today to say yes to Jesus. It's pretty ugly out in the world to do that, and you know that. This is a place where you can come and experience God's love and God's people's love today. Will you pray with me? Father, as we come to this point in time in our service, may May your Spirit just open the hearts in in our lives to respond to your call and your invitation and 
Father, what you want to do in our lives today. It's not about us. Father, it's all about you. And today, we look to you and thank you and trust you for your promises that we can stand on. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.